Did you bring gum? No. Ah, well, you didn't bring it up for everyone. We'll be underway momentarily. I'm just putting my phone back together. We're supposed to have other actors. I think is Spike supposed to be here? I don't think Spike would be here. I would think Spike would be here. Isn't uh, Gray? And... This stars Jamie McGonagall, Daryl Jolo, Amanda Winley, yeah. Richard Horvitz. Lies! Spike Spencer. Lies! Lies! Ricky is supposed to be here. Ah, Ricky, ah. Ricky yeah. will not be here. Ricky Greg? is in the restroom. Greg? Greg? <laughs> I, got, like, I was like, I got all emotionally excited for a second, like this fast attack. <laughs> I'm over the I'm over the Well, it's after seven, so I guess we should start something, right? All right, we'll start something. Welcome to something night. None of us know what it is about. Do you know what it's about? Actually, I do. Okay, good. What is it? Take over, Kyle. Okay, it's stage acting yes. versus VO. Okay. One, you're on a stage, and the other, you're in a booth. Okay, we're the done. Good night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you can also throw in TV and movies. Yes, and right. On stage and all that other stuff too, because there's all that. kinds of stuff that we do. <laughs> I can tell you why VO is better than on camera and on stage. Why? Because you don't have to memorize lines. Yeah. Your script's always in front of you. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you look like. Yeah. You're gonna get cast on, you know, based on the range of voices and your acting. Obviously, the, the emphasis of voice acting is acting, not the fact that you can do a million voices. There's a lot of us in the industry that don't have a gazillion voices, but they make Me. money with their. <laughs> 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 So that's the first uh, area that I'd like to, to showcase because just the, the fact that I've always wanted to be a voice actor and I love the fact that you there is a, an anonymity to it. You're in, the, you're in the booth and so if you ever struggled with self-confidence issues and addressing a big crowd, that actually helped build my confidence. Working in radio, that's where I came from. I didn't come from the stage. So I can't speak to being on the stage. These gentlemen, I'm sure, can tell you exponential amounts. Um, my name's Daryl. I like that you use exponential. 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 That's a big That's word. A big word. It is. Did you just learn that one today? I did. I googled it. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Google. That's um, a big word. <laughs> and I guess, how do you spell? Um, and, and, and if you want to ask questions, feel free to lift up your hand, and we'll you know. Look who's coming, Spike Spencer, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Started out as a, uh, I started out as a ten-year-old actor on camera. I did uh, commercials. I was a hand model for Mattel toys, wow. and then uh, around thirteen, I got into. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Don't don't pay attention to the brown spots now. But, uh, those are eight spots. Yes. Uh, I looked like I had like three-year-old hands. So did you grow up in LA? I grew up in LA. Uh, I did uh, musical theater. I became an equity performer at thirteen, which was wow. my first production, which was nice. And I fell in love with theater. And, I, and to be honest with you, um, people always ask like, who were your voiceover idols when you were a kid? And to be honest, I really knew nothing about voiceover acting. You know, it was. They just were cartoons. I was like, oh, those are the voices. And it, it, but I didn't separate the cartoon from the voice, ever. It didn't even occur to me. I was really dumb. <laughs> and um, so basically, uh, I did TV and film, and then around the 80s, someone said, you know, you got a really interesting voice. You should get into animation or the voiceover. Well, how do I do that? I mean, that's how naive I was. And I'd grown up in LA. And so my commercial agent at the time shared an office with a voiceover agency called Sandy Chenard Talent. And you know Sandy? Uh, no, I should have You know Sandy in no, LA? You're in LA. I know who she is. I've never met her. Oh, you've never met her? No, no. Um, so I, um, I, she shared an office with my commercial agent. And I went over and I said, uh, I'd like to get into voiceover. Like, okay, you have a demo? I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? And so they sent me to a place to make a demo, and it was a reel-to-reel. -reel. Remember our old reel-to-reel oh, demos? Old school. This was 1903, <laughs> and uh, the, the uh, phonograph had just been invented. I mean, Edison had just come yeah. um, And uh, from there, I um, um, I just started doing voiceover. <laughs> That's really how I fell into it. Now. I understand this panel is about voiceover versus on camera, or yeah, on stage, stage or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree with Kyle.
know that uh, it's great the voiceover thing is because you can spend eight hours on a set or more for payment wise what we can make in a couple hours in a booth. So um, that's fun. Uh, I still do theater. I still do TV and film and that I love that. So uh, I don't know what else to say. Good night, everybody. And what's your name? And try to speak as loudly as you can. Um, yes, I'm David Vasquez. I would just like to um, get a clear understanding of uh, the character development between a voice actor and a more theater actor, more like method Meisner, where you're like getting deep into character versus a voice actor where those two paths collide. Don't mistake getting deep into a character on stage, film, or TV is more deeply than we do in voice art. I agree. Yeah, 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 I just want to know. But you know, I think they've given me the answers here. <laughs> Blades, skinny, dangerous. Nice. That's what it says. That's what it says. Those are the answers. I don't know where it is. And if that doesn't help you, nothing will. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll just speak quickly about, about that. But I, I started on stage. I grew up in L.A. as well, but not the big L.A. I grew up in capital L, small a, Louisiana. Yay! <laughs> and, um... Louisiana. 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 Uh, well, I'm from I'm from the Cajun area, so so. Yeah, we grew up in uh, that Louisiana. Yeah, uh, yeah, Louisiana. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, the interesting thing would be Kyle said something about like you know when you go into a booth you can no one has to see you and it's kind of great which I also love too you just get to no one has to worry about what you that's like very anything. good point but you know it's funny because when I started acting I was very shy and little kid you know I didn't want anyone to see me either but I felt like when I was in a character it wasn't me you know what I mean like yeah. I could yeah, go yeah. on stage that's and do these thing. lines and do these things and but in my own real life. I was like, okay, what this? But as long as it was like, it's not me, it's someone else, I was able to go out and do that stuff. And um, then I went to LA and I went to American Academy of Dramatic Arts. So we did a day, studied a lot of uh, stage, we did Shakespeare, we did different, we did different, a lot of teachers came from different methods, like Meisner or Uta Hagen, are you familiar with her? Yeah. Um, yeah. I love her ice cream. Yeah. Uda Hagen. Uda Hagen. Uda Hagen. Uda Hagen And uh, but actually, she's one of my favorites. Actually, uh, she has an incredible book called Respect for Acting. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so one of my teachers came from her, and so she, you know, sort of used that. But um, yeah, I mean, it's like he said. You know, I feel like too with when I'm doing the voiceover stuff, we may not have like the time that we do for stage or even some film and stuff where you get to rehearse or research yeah. a character, it's on the fly. But I think okay. if you have you know, some of the training that you're able to do it quickly when you need to, you know, and able to recall the emotions. Or... Yeah, I always say that I approach every medium exactly the same. I approach voiceover, theater, stage, film, TV, radio, the same way. I look at what the story is. Even in a commercial, there's a story that we have. If we have one line, like, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. I teach, I teach voiceover um, for animation, and one of the things I always do is I give a commercial piece of copy out. And it's always the same, it's the same piece of copy. It was, um, with all the great things to do in New Mexico, it just may be the greatest place on earth. So most people go up and they just, they try to sound the part. You know, like they either sound an announcer or something. But I always say, you know, one, you have to be talking to someone. Uh, and two, why are you talking? Why are you saying what you're saying? So and for me, when I approach anything in any medium, it's always about being informed. It's like, why am I saying what I'm saying? And it's not just because it's written for me. So like for that particular piece of copy, what I teach is, um, look, you're, you're, you're trying to act like you really love New Mexico. But that's really hard to do if something doesn't resonate. Then you feel fake, right? You feel like you're, you're pretending to be New Mexico. <laughs> but I, I always ask myself, what is a case where I would actually say these things? And I know what it is. My wife wants to go to New Mexico. I don't want to go to New Mexico, but I'm going to lose this battle. So I go anyway, and I discover I'm having a good time. And because my thing that resonates for me is that I will never admit when I'm wrong, 
I make it like it was my idea. <laughs> With all the great things to do in New Mexico, it might just be the greatest place on earth. That's the Jackie Gleason take, right? <laughs> now suddenly I have a reason for talking, and that is my take on it. Is it the same as these guys? Ricky. No, because we all have different takes. Yeah. Well, Ricky, glad you could join us. How was the restroom break, Ricky? I'm still peeing. Okay. <laughs> that is my two cents. Well, I was going to say that uh, as far as the, the film acting and, and voice acting goes, it's, it's called voice acting. So that's the one thing we always tell people, when, I, when I'm teaching somebody or I'm teaching like Tara about how to be a freaking genius voice actor panel, right? First thing I'm going to tell you is, what do you do? You take acting classes. That's right. You have to train. I'm in the class of a trained actor as well, as uh, you guys are as well, of course you guys are. Not everyone is, but uh, that is the course. We are actors. That's right. Uh, and when we're in the booth, we're doing the best we can to give an honest representation of what is happening then. What, and, and we do whatever the hell the director tells us. <laughs> exactly, and we, nothing gives us more of a pet peeve than people that say to us, do you guys still act? That drives us nuts. <laughs> I mean, I do, do you, like, act, do you, like, yeah, do you like, act anymore? Do you do real acting? Yeah, right. Oh. Yeah, do you guys act anymore? And there's nothing more offensive because it's harder to do voiceover a lot of the time than it is to look, make a look with your face. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you're angry. Sort of. Not at all! <laughs> Well, it's fun because a lot of times, some of the roles that we get, I mean, every now and then, like, for example, uh, Shinji, Evangelion, that is an acting role because, I mean, that's a lot of heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching, you know, vocal cord exploding uh, action, and I had to really get into that. Now, not a lot of them are going to go that way. A lot of crazy characters are just fun and silly and, and awesome to do. But you, having that background makes it real. When I'm in the booth and, and, and when Shinji's crying and stuff, usually I'm crying. You know, I mean, that's just how we get into it. And I'm, some people do, some people don't. But uh, the, having the acting background on film uh, really, really helps immensely. Good question. So I want to know is that if you're, not, if you're not, say for example, if you're not majoring in acting, what is the alternative you can you can do? Where and I know you can take acting classes, but what where is the best place to start? Is it New York? Is it LA? Or is it can it be in your hometown? Are you in college? Yes. Is there an improv group at your college? Yeah. That's the best place to start. All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. There's not you one. do lots of improv, don't I you? I do lots. I do lots of improv still. So. Yeah. So yeah, I do comedy sports. Yeah. So I mean. Same. Different, different theater sports. Theater sports. It's it's all about improv, but we we come from from different uh, techniques. Yeah. I did a groundlings for groundlings. That's your best bet. The bloody girl, way in the back. Are there any techniques that you do for like when you're warming up for a role? Like Scotch. <laughs> Voiceover uh, in particular is if you keep talking, your vocal cords are okay. It's when you stop talking that they swell. Yeah. And once they swell, you can't the, the vocal cords won't vibrate against each other anymore, and you can't get the sound out. So that's kind of why um, when I'm recording, I keep talking so that if I don't, like I'll go to sleep tonight and I'll wake up in the morning and I'll be like I'll be like this, and it'll take me hours to get it back. But I like to sing, singing on the way to, um, to uh, um, jobs or anything, auditions or anything. I like to sing because it not only gets you going, gets you up. Uh, Midnight and the kitty is king. Uh, I like to do that. I don't know their details. I don't really have any methods. Um, I do know that if I have a session first thing in the morning, you have that morning voice, and, then, uh, and you got yes. this funk on your vocal cords. Yes. There's different tricks, like, you know, throat coat, you know, some yeah. hot tea. Yeah. I have some tea. stuff right here, as a matter of fact. Singer Saving Grace? I have Saving Grace. Singer okay. Saving Grace. Yeah. Singer Saving It's a little what? wild. It tastes right nasty. Here. I swear by it, though. Right here. Yeah. It's swear by it. He's I absolutely right. Taste it's still right. in it. Uh, yeah. It's like ass. Yes, so. right. <laughs> but it works. Yeah. Free spray. I'm going to it's like oh. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes like shame. Well, listen, it's, 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 it's like 
with your, your diction, like I, because in Shakespeare, a lot of times before a play, I took a cork in my mouth and you say the lines with the cork between your teeth, and that helps your diction. So I, I sometimes do that early in the morning. If like I you to. drink the bottle of wine I, and you can't. I drink the bottle of wine. Well, that'd be neat. Yes. <laughs> that, how about uh, hot sauce? Is that good for you? Hot sauce is just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, I, I'm great. I, I love spicy food. Yeah. So. Yeah, you can do Tabasco. Oh, yeah. Wow. Really? Like, 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 I grew up here there. there. <laughs> I've never done that. Enough of that. Apple vinegar is good. Apple yes. cider vinegar. That stuff is great. Oh, you Apple know, I've tried yeah, yeah. these uh, ginger, these things called this little ginger thing you suck on that's supposed to be really good. It's a, some candy I found. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot that. Golden. Some golden throat. Golden throat. Golden throat. Golden throat. Yeah. Oh, there was something else I, I tried. Um, gosh, oh, I wish I had, I had a picture of it. I'll send it to you guys. It was something really crazy and interesting. Crack? <laughs> <laughs> no. That would be Ricky's kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ricky, the best voice factor in this panel. <laughs> but I'm Why is it always like this? <laughs> um, I have actually, have, I, I have like, uh, everything I do, I have... Just a quiet moment that lasts for like seven hours when I have to sit there and do it. Before I can do anything. In fact, on, like on Zim, they would they didn't think I would I would have any life in me when I would ever I would come in in the morning and be like, um, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, it's fine. I'd have to after a while. What what session was that? So Ricky is it's all right. the ones that you were. <laughs> um, I was wondering, I know I heard musical theater thrown around, is vocal music training, has that been helpful to any of you? Do you recommend it? Do you have any experience? I haven't had any of it. I can't I'm, sing with the crap. <laughs> I, I, you know what I think it's good for? It's good for knowing your instrument. I know that sounds a yeah. little, um, it sounds a little uh, heady or a little uh, pretentious. Right? A little bit. A little bit. Well, I, don't refer, I don't refer to it as Get my out. instrument, I refer to it as my throat. But you know, it's knowing where to put notes. Like some people, like I happen to be a throat talker, so I know that that's where most of my voices come from. But like if I wanted to sound like Kyle, this is as close as I'm ever going to get. My voice is going to blow out because I can't lower into my chest. <laughs> So I know that I have a limitation. My 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 range is from here to here. <laughs> you can't talk like this. Yeah. It's a yeah. Exactly. It's Stop copying my voice. <laughs> so yeah, it helps to know what you can do with your voice, and vocal training does that. It also stretches your vocal cords in range. Yeah, I think for most of us, we we probably are always experimenting with new voices. I mean, something will happen. We're just going walk, you know, walking along, and something. Will well, that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. That's something new. You know, so you kind of catalog that and, and do that. You'll find things. Is for the longest time that kind of voice with the. Uh, you guys can probably all do it. That. <laughs> that's the Gollum. That's the Gollum voice. Yeah, sort of the Gollum thing. But it's it's so many people can do that. I could never do that until like two years ago, and I just kind of played around. Anyway, oh, oh, God. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a good one. It's good to know that you try these things. You know, there are there are people in our business like. Uh, there are people in our business like Dee Bradley Baker and Frank Welker who spend their time finding the places in their voice that create monsters and crickets and all sorts of things. And they're, like, they're what I refer to as real uh, sound effects yeah. actors because it, the things they can do, I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, he is not human. He is, he is, he is, he is like, not human. He's amazing. 
He is an automaton. Yes. yes. Do it. Okay. Um, I knew it. Um, I guess, is it behind me or here? Okay. You. Oh, okay. Yay. All right. Um, I'm classically trained, I guess you could say. I've done years of like theater acting and stage acting and stuff like that before I got sick and was forced into the hospital, which is when I discovered voice acting and was fascinated by the idea. And I like the idea, but I was curious since I'm stuck here in Ohio and not a theater major because of my physical limitations. Um, would you suggest things like getting an agent or something to help move the process along since some of us are stuck in the Midwest and not in like the acting capitals? Uh, there are regional act, uh, agencies everywhere. Yeah. Well, are you talking about just voiceover? Yeah, just voiceover. Well, I mean, there's there's tons of work in voiceover that doesn't, you know, you don't have to be in L.A. or New York for, for a lot of it. I mean, for That's what true. we do, you need to be in these places. But there's radio here, you know. I mean, there's lots of radio. Uh, yes, you got to have an agent, obviously. But uh, we don't always have to have an agent. That's not the end run of everything. But being professional, giving good product, make sure you have a good demo and a web presence, and then network your ass off. <laughs> the one thing I always uh, caution people like about ass, is to <laughs> not <laughs> not go to demo before you're ready. Yeah. yeah. Well, you don't want to, when you true. make a demo, what would you put on it? <clears throat> um, voices. Well, but, you well, yeah. oh, oh. but you know, also it depends what you want to do it for because there there's separate demos for uh, like commercials. Yeah. There's separate demos for for animation. Narration. So narration, uh, books on tape is completely different. Promos, so, so, imaging. I That's know. what I was more curious about, like, because I've listened to separate demos, and some people would kind of mash their, I guess. Here's the together. trick to the demo when you ask, what should I put on it? You shouldn't have to answer that for yourself. If you hire a good producer, which is what you want to do, they will help, they will pick copy, and you'll rehearse it before you ever go to demo. I always warn people that, that if you're going to go do a demo, never trust a person that just gives you copy on, this, on the spot and says, okay, come back on Thursday and we'll record it. You can't do it. You're not going to get a good demo. No matter how good you are, you've got to spend time rehearsing it with that person that's producing the demo. Ideally, the best thing you can have is actual work that has been on the air, that has been good professional quality stuff. Get copies of that, piece all that together. That's a beautiful demo. There's nothing but professional. Yeah. Sounds good. I've always just told people, train first yep. and then invest in demo because while the technology exists to make a good sounding demo on a technical level, that doesn't mean you're going to showcase the best you have to offer as a trained actor. You train first, and then you pay good money, and it is good money. It's not cheap. Not cheap. No. You know, you go to medical school for 12 years, you know, you got to pay money to learn the craft and to pay your dues, as they always say. Uh, but yeah, you don't just skip all that and say, I can record at Frank's place on his, on his exactly. PC and put something together in, in two hours. Yes, you can. But I came from radio, and without any training or anything, I kept putting together technically competent demos that got absolutely nowhere. And then once I started taking classes, then suddenly I, I invested in the demo, had a, had a voice acting coach that helped, and suddenly I had a competent LA quality commercial demo. It's just very unfortunate to be trapped in yes. Ohio. But you have to stop thinking that way. Yeah. You have to stop thinking I'm trapped in Ohio. First of all, you're young, and second of all, uh, yeah, trust us, compared to us, you're young. Uh, at least me, at least Ricky. And remember, we're going to sound young for the rest <laughs> yeah, of our lives. <laughs> so the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, it, it's a law of nature. The greater the determination, the greater the obstacles. That's true. And so it's how you confront those obstacles. Okay, well, I'm in the Midwest. What can I do while I'm here? And then don't argue for your limitations. It's a big thing that I, I teach. Blow up the Midwest. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, I like, just say I one like thing? Ricky's idea the best. Let's well, get it down. About, about agencies and such, I have about six different agents across the country. So I have some, I get auditions from uh, North Carolina, from Georgia, from Denver, stuff that we're never going to see in LA. You know, local, regional things that we don't even get over there. But I've got agents all over, so I get these things. So you can do that. Once you get a good demo, you can have agent representation anywhere. All your auditions go over email. You attach them, and off you go. And then uh, if you get booked, you just book a studio, unless you have your own home studio, which I kind of do. So it's like, it works pretty well that way. But there's a lot you can do. If you want to hear any sort of patterns in demos, go to voicebank.net. Yeah, right yeah. Just hit on any random site. Okay, you're female. Just listen to, pick, pick some ladies. And oh, just yes, listen to their female. commercials. Thank you for noticing. I appreciate well, that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying it, it, it wouldn't make sense for you to listen to dudes. You know, you need to listen to your competition. What 
you know, these excerpts are about, what, eight to 10 seconds a piece, and the, the, the average length of a demo is whittled down to about 60 seconds nowadays, not three minutes and all that stuff. And, and it starts with the signature sound, yeah. you know? Not, you know, in, in a movie, the climax is the best part of the movie, the biggest thing. You almost want to blow your one in the beginning. You almost want to put it all in the beginning <laughs> because everyone has a short attention span. You know? Those pebbles are later, Richard. Uh, they're going to shut your demo off after 10 seconds if they don't like what they hear. So you almost have to put your, like, I'm awesome right now! And then they're going to go, wow, they're kind of awesome. I'm going to keep listening. In animation right now, <clears throat> agents want your natural voice yeah. as the first thing on your animation demo. Yep. Old school was like, <laughs> that sort of crap. <laughs> um, and now they want just your voice beforehand because we cast animation the same way as we ca cast on, cam on camera. Based on the breakdown, we're looking for this kind of personality. Someone funny, someone this, I'll give me Spike, or you know, something like that. It's not just how many different voices you Yeah, if you, look, if you look at the voices like an adventure type, those are all natural voices. All natural voices. <clears throat> all the yeah. adults cartoon network like stuff. Everyone different. just sounds normal. Well, it's exactly. like Disney's, every time I audition for Disney, they're all, all just, natural no, no, just bring it down, bring it down, bring it down, bring it down. Yeah, all the yeah, all the, our, the cartoon stuff I'm reading for now is now start saying it's like not cartoony, not, not, yeah, not top. We want real, exactly. we want, you know. which lets me out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mine kind of pertains to her question about like being trapped in the Midwest, but like I have kind of researched this for a year, and I have not started a demo yet since I haven't contacted anyone. But in uh, this area. Like to gain a more like a portfolio, basically, you can go to CCAD or Otterbein and ask any students if they need any voice actors. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes That's for Otterbein, yeah, yeah. yeah I think for Otterbein they need a, a narrator for a commercial they're making for a class, and CCAD for animation. And then uh, I heard WNCI, the radio station, is pretty big on on voice actors. And an agency, once you're ready, is. It's spelled hey man, like one word, payment agencies. So there's that too. Hey, you know, thank you. Guys you. Have, like, it's very good. You guys have like public access channel here? A public access channel? Anything like that in Columbus? Do you know? If you were to have W O S. Because you know they may need uh, people for that as well. Something like that. <laughs> Well, one thing also, if, if you uh, like these colleges and stuff you're talking about, a lot of times outside of the acting areas, they'll, they'll have a big pinup board where people put all kinds of different things. Go there, put up a thing that says, I will narrate or whatever, I'm a voice talent, I'm looking to expand my uh, repertoire or whatever, and you know, give me a call, and I'll help out for free. If um, you were to be like building an at home studio or something like that, or at least something to help. Bring your friend home uh, yeah, in know. my car. <laughs> I, at this point, at home studio is in a college budget. There you so go. Where I can tell you the cheapest, fastest thing. This is what I have in my house, okay? I got a really nice microphone. That's the thing. You got to have a good microphone, period. But you got to have a space that is quiet. And so foam is like the thing you want to have all around, you know, that, that, that really I, neat like sound foam. Yeah, well here's what I did. I went to Walmart and I got the bed toppers. Yeah. It's about that thick, you know, it's got all the different ridges and everything, and I cut that stuff up and put it all over the walls. Works perfectly. I, I do professional gigs in my little closet studio. What the professional home is like $300 a square foot. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it cost me 35 bucks. What kind of like microphone and recording programs do you uh, oh, you know, there's a great one. Uh, Audacity is free online. That's what I've been using for just the technical part of it, yeah. for the recording and everything. But my microphone, I use a, a Bluebird. I have one of those. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's really good for, for, for my like, voice. You guys like the Yeti? I do like the Yeti. I don't know the Yeti. I like the, the Yeti, the Blue Yeti. I'm fond of the Abominable The Blue Yeti from, uh, <laughs> from Apple. It's very good. Um, it's the next generation of the original, which was the Snowball, right? Was snowball, the, yeah. I yes. do not like Snowball. Don't like Snowball. I had that for a while. It's a... Yeah, but the Blue Yeti is a good one. Okay. You know what I did? I, I, you want to go really on a budget? This is what I did for like five years. Last month? Five years, yeah. Um, I was using uh, the Snowball for a little while, and my agent was like, man, it's just not working. It's just kind of, it's tinny, it's not it's working. Tinny. Yeah. yeah, and I said, well, you know, one day I was re recording for like World of Warcraft and World of Combat auditions. I had like 13 and 13. I'm going through them. I'm just tearing them up, and I'm listening to it. It sounds great and everything, and I go to get ready to detach everything, and I look down, and I hadn't attached a damn thing. You know what happened? 
It sounded great. I sent it in, and I said, tell me what you think of these. She goes, these are much better. It's the microphone on my, my, Mac, my MacBook. Oh, you had to disable the I had, no, no, yeah, I had, I had not connected the mic. Oh, you had not? So it, this was the oh, mic no. on my MacBook. Oh, so you had connected the... the <laughs> Didn't connect it at all. So it was the mic on my MacBook. It, no, it wasn't nothing. It was just opening it up and hitting record. Yeah. And it was on that, and I did that for years. Here's what's it's amazing. It's not great, but... I've got a friend that books jobs off of his iPad yeah. with, a, with a Blue Yeti mic because they have an interface. You go right into your iPad, and it's amazing. I'm like, are you serious? If we travel you know, somewhere out of the country or something, and he gets an audition, he's got his iPad, or he does I'm like, whoa. Well, I don't have the whole setup here. I just did a yeah. good gig today, and it's you know we you do you do the uh, the the hotel bedroom studio action, three pillows, you put your stuff right here, and then you take the blanket, <laughs> and you're in a little tent, and that's your studio. So like, I'm a professional. <laughs> it works. Way in the back. Way in the back. You sir. Right. No, that's you me. sir. Uh, I was wondering what you prefer as a, like for example in stage. You have the opportunity to play off the audience, to improvise on the fly, or do you prefer the fact that in the studio you have that option of taking the best take of like three zillion takes? Well, I, I mean, for me, because I've done, I've done a lot of stages with you, but um, I love having that that feeling from the audience because it's yeah, that and because it's different each night when you do a, a play. And you know, it's, it's just weird. I don't know how to explain it. It's just weird because you feel the audience. You, you know, you're responding to the act, Makes the other you actors. Feel yeah, yeah. And you're listening. You're doing this full story. And um, but you know, it's like like uh, Richard said that um, you know each thing that we do is I look at them at it all the same. You know, even though it's different mediums. So the it's um, playing pretend. Yeah, and, and like the response I get, let's say for doing, uh, when I'm doing anime uh, in a booth by myself, you know, sometimes I don't get to hear anyone in English at all speak back to me, I'm just hearing the Japanese. Um, and yet, but then, then that's when I have to also use my instincts, listen to the director, uh, play off of even the Japanese and what I've seen, what I've heard, you know, and that's maybe even what kind of keeps us fresh a bit. Um, for me, uh, Video games are tough for me because the way we record video games is not the same as the way we usually record our animation, which is in a, it's called a radio radio um, brought radio code, radio record, in which we're all in the room. Hopefully, if we're available, and we're all acting off each other. Video games are tough for me because most of the time we don't know what level they're working on, uh, so they'll just give you like this thick of a script of line after line after line after line after line. After line of game commands. And you won't really know what's going on. They'll try to explain it to you, but you don't have like a broader understanding a lot of the time of the overall game. So we're doing that one line three times in a row. And often we do um, efforts over and over and over again. So it's a, uh, you know, give us a short attack. Yeah. Ah! Yeah. Give us a longer attack. Ah! Now that just it, like drives me nuts. Yeah. It drives us all nuts. Heavy attack, light attack, medium attack, and three different three different ones. Yeah. All at once. So you just you gotta think of three different ones to do right then and there. Yeah. And you're screaming for hours. And you're yeah. screaming for hours. Hour time. <laughs> um so that that is not to me I'll take stage over that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that is hard. Actually, with one thing, since we really don't get a chance to see each other in the booth, this is the chance we get to actually see each other. Because yeah. um, even when you do work on a project together, a lot of you don't even know who's in the day. Right. You don't even know what you're working on half the time. <laughs> but uh, one thing that's great is uh, every now and then you do get to be in the room together, which is I find so much fun. Uh, Kyle, we've been in the room together, you and me, yeah. and Silverstein. Yeah. And, um, but it's great because I remember one time it was me and Richard Epcar and the producer of this one game we were doing. It was Vandal Hearts, uh, something a long time ago. And it's the three, here's three grown men in a booth, and we're screaming different ways we're dying. It's like, okay, now you're being pummeled by rocks. Okay, now you're, uh, there's a wall of water. <laughs> I'm looking around and going, this is cool. I was on a, uh, I was on a World of Warcraft session the other, like, two months ago. And, um, it was that big one where it's like they, they did an ADR session where they brought in all the voices and the, and um, 
there was a morning group and an afternoon group. <laughs> and the morning group oh, were just like, oh my God, this is. And then the afternoon group kind of crossed over with them. And the afternoon group were all energetic now. They got great ideas. And we were just like this. The morning group were just like, oh my God, I have no voice left. And one of the people on the group, after we did this long pass, went, hey, I have an idea. What if we all scream when blah, 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 because we had just gotten there. And all of us in the morning group went, <laughs> why don't you do that pass? That drove me nuts. That drove me nuts. You got the job already. <laughs> yes, we're back there. You, yes, you. Uh, point, you pointing at yourself. Yes. Uh, I've been wondering because I'm sure like a lot of people in here, you know, even people in tell, oh, you should do voice acting. You're such a great. It's basically it's just impressions we're doing. Like we copy others. Like I think you said, listen to others and try to mimic what they do. But you know, that's great if you want to be an impressionist. But I think I've always thought like if you want to be a voice acting, you have to have your own voices. So you don't just sound like mimicking others. And like this right here, this isn't my natural voice because I'm a transgender. I had to construct this, and it took me four years to do this. So I'm wondering, like, do you have tips to do this? Because I really have no idea what I did to get this. But do you have like sort of, I guess, tips to sort of uh, speed up the process somewhat when you need to come up with a voice fast? Can I uh, break in real fast sure. and say I had no idea in line that you were. That is a fucking fantastic voice. That is amazing. Clap yeah. for her. <laughs> Uh, well, one thing that I, I, I always do it in uh, any voice I see, I, I go from the visuals if I can. I look at the character and say, oh, this character's going to have this voice. He's going to be deep and he's going to be this. But I, I do a layer where I just say, okay, is it a high or a low voice? So it's a high voice. Okay, so it's a high voice. I'm going to do it like this. And I see, is it breathy, breathy or gravelly? I mean, this is very, very simple. I know guys who layer it like 11, 12 different ways. <laughs> Genius. Uh, I'm not that smart. You know? I'm going to open the door the Disney way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really, you know, that you add to the high. Let's say you got a high voice, you add to it with uh, gravelly or breathy. If you go breathy, it's going to be, hi, it's great, it's wonderful, like it. You go with gravelly, oh, it's great, it's fun, it's wonderful, it's crazy. You know, and you can start playing with your voice that way. Um, and you, you will find all kinds of different combinations. And then throw in a couple of uh, accents if you can do them. And you're going to come up with some really great characters that way if you want to do it that way. Or, like you said, the impersonations, go off of an impersonation and then take it away, a different different angle. Like, I've done different characters that are basically Cartman. Lots of them. Who here saw Gantz? May I see Gantz? Remember that Green Onion Alien? That was me, and that was basically Cartman. If you if you break it down, you listen to all these things. <laughs> so it's, it's that kind of thing. So you can play with it. Go go with what you have, and then to you know veer off. Yeah. What I was saying earlier was like listen to the demos for the idea of what sort of material is on a demo. Uh, I never said uh, you know you should do impressions. If you can do impressions, that's great for parties. But that's a different uh, demo. Yeah. I mean, there is a niche of voiceover yeah. work called voice matching. That's right. And that's where it comes into play, when the celebrities won't come in for whatever reason, and then they call it, well, we need someone to voice match so-and-so for the TV edit of this R-rated movie, or right. whatever. Right. Right. And oftentimes, you may think you're doing a great imitation, and you're not, and you've got to create a new character. I mean, I got lots of characters, like in Angry Beavers, uh, I started out as Lou Costello, but it sounded more like uh, Time Daly. <laughs> and, um, and then by the end of it, it was, it was Jack Lemmon in Glen Gary, Glen Ross. And in my mind, it sounded like, hey, I said 10, you said 20, give me those leads. But it, it, it sounded nothing like Jack Lemmon, in my mind it did. And that was how I ended up doing that character. In my head, that's what I was thinking, Jack Lemmon's great. Yeah. You're old. Also, if you, you're a dick. Um, oh, yeah, right. what, one thing, um, if you listen to a lot of impersonations, they don't sound at all like the real person, but we all know when somebody goes, y'all do it, get down. We all know, oh, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger, and then you listen to him, he's like, not really. Everybody does a walk in, everybody does a dance, and does a walk. It's never sounds just like them, usually. It's always a caricature. You know, but they kind of veer off. It's a caricature, exactly. Yeah. Way back there. Way back there. When you film multiple parts, how do you one another? You mean in the same show? Uh, oftentimes we record them in one pass if they're if it's just the two of them in a room, like on Billy and Mandy. 
I was off in Billy's dad and, Gee, Dad, how's it going? Billy, it's time for Mogar. Mogar! And then we just talk back and forth. <laughs> but if it's like multiple things, different passes. I mean, you kind of have to. I mean, I did a video game one time where I didn't, I didn't know I was going in to do multiple voices, and I think I did like 16 voices on one thing, and I didn't know I was going to be doing that. Yeah, there was four. There was like four kind of. It was romantic, romantic saga, a minstrel song. You didn't know that? Like, minstrel or minstrel? <laughs> minstrel. No, I don't know that one. Well, that's, the, that's the other game. Yes. You don't want to talk about that. <laughs> But you know, and then, and then you sort of have to remember because it's kind of like categorizing your brain while you're doing it. Okay, I did that voice of that one, so now I have to go to this play, you know. And I'm kind of like Spike, too. I need kind of visual, like, so if I get sort of a visual idea of what the character is going to look like, that really helps me a lot, you know, in terms of knowing how he's going to sound. So. Yeah. But again, in the end, we just do what the director tells us, so. Exactly. If it sucks, blame them. You're a 400 year old demon, and he smokes. <laughs> Ready, go. Because all we're looking at is an Excel spreadsheet. I will suck your soul. <laughs> go on. I like those instructions where they go, like, oh, you need to do it faster, but that has to be a little bit slower. Oh, yeah. 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 God, yes. Massage it a little. Give me, give me 10% less. Yeah. Can you speed it up, but he's going slow? Yeah, well that, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of the frustration in anime that we have a lot of the times if we're dubbing is that we may have this great characterization, but we don't have the time because we're matching lip flaps and it right. gets us frustrated a lot of the time because we want to do more with it. Did you say lip flaps? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and it gets really frustrating for us sometimes because we have this great idea, it's like, yeah, you want to do this, and it doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit in that time, and so we kill people. <laughs> that's not, I mean, it really is. I think uh, I, I, you probably agree with me. I mean, matching lip flaps and stuff. This is the hardest job in voiceover. It's so hard to do, and it pays the least. Yeah. It really sucks butt. The matching lip flaps is my favorite punk band. <laughs> <laughs> they sing minstrel song. Minstrel. <laughs> Acoustic. <laughs> You with the hair. Um, so how do you balance staying active within your character as to matching the lip flaps or whatever it may be, staying within these refined, you know, yes. parameters between staying active within what you've set for your character and what they believe to be true? Record hentai? <laughs> Yeah, you match I only did it once, I was younger, I needed the money. <laughs> you match the intensity of the scene. In anime dubbing, you know, we watch it once in Japanese, we say, well, how loud or soft can we deliver this line? What's the context of it? So we, yeah. we see that and base it off of that. You know, if it's animated really big, then obviously it doesn't make sense to whisper it. You know? But, you know, I think, too, uh, I think what you're getting to is that not only is it that we're acting, but we, it's also technical. Because we also have to be on time. On time. We're thinking about, okay, Here's my script. I'm looking at this line for the very first time. I have to bring everything about my acting to it, and I'm watching a time code from one eye. Yeah. Right. I'm, there's the, the beeps. We we go off the fourth beep. I'm watching the time code. I'm watching the lip flaps, and I'm looking at the script. So you have to have three eyes. And we're hungry. Yes. Yes. And you're hungry, or you have a headache. And we have a headache. I had a migraine one time in a booth, oh. having to do a character. I mean, literally, I got hit with a migraine in the last 30 minutes of a character, and my character was a screaming character. Oh. So, and I wanted to throw up. So, I had it was so horrible. You should and just throw up. I just yeah, thrown up. <laughs> and, but, but you know what I mean? Like, so you're, you, you know, you may not feel good that day. You know, but you're going in and you have to bring everything to it. So I was even trying to psych myself out, like, I do not have a migraine. <laughs> yeah, right. You're right, yeah. And so I'm doing all these things. Inherent in saying you yeah. don't have a migraine is that you do you have a mic? Draw it into you. And, yeah, I mean, and the, the thing is, when I was doing it, I didn't feel it as much. However, when they, they're like messing with it and trying to make it work, and I'm like waiting for the next line, that's when I was like, oh, just come on, let me just say the line, let me get over this. And then, of course, they had pizza. Like, yeah. after, you know, that smell of pizza. Oh, God. You know. So now you really are hungry. Yeah, and I was just pretending, like, oh, I'm doing great. Let me sign the contract and get out of here. It's not going to be any pizza so, left. You know, there, there's all that stuff we, we don't think about, you know, that how you feel, you know, that day. 
You know, there's so much that, that goes on, you know. It really is. If you look at the technical aspect of this, this is really a, a, a very well-coordinated dance between the directors, the actors, the, the people who translated everything, the sound engineer, the producers, everybody. It's like a Hollywood movie on a smaller scale, but how a Hollywood movie ever gets made, I have no freaking clue. It's crazy. If you look at all of the, everything that goes into making this uh, film, it's pretty nuts. So, it's hot. I'm just saying. But fun. Yeah. Okay. I got to go. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to leave this panel. Oh, I'm awesome. sorry. I would love to say. I know. I would love to say I have a panel. Uh, I have to go to right now. I'm doing "Don't Kill Your Date" and other cooking tips <laughs> right now. So um, you guys have a fantastic panel. It was a pleasure and an honor to be up here with these amazing people. Give my hand. When you're done here, feel free to pop by, don't get your date. Yes. That's what we're going to do. What room am I in? Delaware AB. Delaware AB. Delaware AB. Come on over, there'll be pie. Pie not included. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just want to say something really quick about uh, also um, a good way of practicing. Is I was part of a group called Playwright Six, and what they did is it was it was for playwrights, excuse me. It was a, it was for playwrights, but they had actors come in in the evening and they would present their new works. So they would pick actors from the group and they would say, okay, you read this, you... He's gonna go pee. Oh, no. He wants to go to us oh, closer to the group. Oh, Let's be included. Oh, okay. Come on over. <laughs> but for, for voice acting, because we see the script for the very first time when we go in, we don't get it ahead of time. So cold reading just is, is invaluable. Because if you're not used to you know, having a line just given to you, and we're not talking about one line, we're talking about you know, 70 some odd lines. Or and they more. often rewrite them on the and fly. And they rewrite them in, on the fly, so you have to be like that. And so cold reading helped me a lot, uh, yeah. being part of a group like that. That's a good, that's a good piece of advice. Um, I had a question about, uh, it's probably mostly going to apply to Richard, but um, you guys were talking earlier about like the voice acting versus stage acting and the audience reactions. Well, technically, most of us are audiences and That's consumers. Right. We're fandom, which is a lot different. How do you guys typically feel when you find out what happens to your characters in fandom? Meaning, like fan fiction? Fan stuff? fiction, fan art. We, we don't. We don't really pay attention to this. We don't really? read. Or, we don't read. Or, I would be interested. <laughs> yeah, we just you know live our life. <laughs> Yeah, we know that there's this thing called Rule 34, yeah. and you know, the world, the internet is what it is. Yeah. Richard doesn't want to be scarred for life, that's all right. I've already been scarred for life, have you met me? <laughs> yes. Okay, I think for me the hardest part about voice acting is whether or not you know what you sound like, because uh, it's kind of hard even that, like, That's the biggest problem, people are listening to themselves. Right. Like, that's, you, yes, I know what you're saying, because you're listening to yourself. And if you're listening to yourself, then you're not entering what I call the secondary reality and playing in that world. But you did it as a kid. When you were a kid, did you play a make-believe game? Yes. You, okay. What did you play? I don't remember. Did you play House? No. Did you play Star Wars? Did you play some make-believe game? I was a dragon a long time. You were a dragon? And what did you say as a dragon? You said I'm a dragon, right? Now, say you play, and you go, I'm a dragon, and you play, and you play, and you play. And at the end of that make-believe time, when your mom says it's time for your friends to go home, come in and clean up for dinner or whatever, did you ever say to your friends, let me ask you something. When I said, I am a dragon, did you believe me? Or should I have gone, I am a dragon? Or should I have gone, I am a dragon, I am a dragon? You didn't. You just played. You weren't listening to yourself then. But suddenly, you get older, and you put so much on it, like making a career, becoming famous, getting money, getting an agent, not losing an agent, all those things that stop you from playing pretend. That's the key. Those of us that continue to do this on a regular basis, we just play pretend over and over again. The listening to ourselves aspect of it goes away. But in, in the beginning, you're gonna be your harshest judge, so you gotta learn not to do that. You gotta remember what it was like to play. That's all I do. And yell at Ricky. Stop yelling at Ricky. Um, so like on something like a cold reading, where do you find the like greatest ease on like a jump off point where 
you know, maybe it's the thing that hooks you the most or something that you have a deep emotional connection to. Where do you usually work from? Well, you, you the keep, first point. You keep coming to, to this deep emotional connection to, and we really don't have a deep con emotional connection to it right off the bat. Yeah. You have to. The, the leap off point is knowing what's going on in the story. You got to read it like a good book, so you know. I always say to myself, "What situation do I find myself in in, in this story?" And then I pick out one one sentence. There's a sentence I can pick out that I can hang my hat on. That if that's what I go after, like in that feel the inflection on certain words yeah. in your reading, and that's what I do. Um, the fact of the matter is, it's just because we audition it and we get a callback or we get the job, the work's not done. We probably didn't have a deep emotional connection to it at that point. We just had fun doing it, yeah. and then the more we play the character, the more it becomes part of our our make believe world. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the thing because you're playing, especially in anime, because you know you're playing this character in so many episodes. You know, you grow into it more and more and more as you get to know the character even more, and you start identifying. I mean, for me, you know, I look at a face of a character that I'm doing, and I, I just start identifying with them. Like, oh, well, that's I feel like, oh, that's me. You know, I mean, it's funny because even when I'm walk, walking around the con, I see some like Mikado, you know, from Dora, you know, in some of the bag or you know, bags or a plush or whatever. I'm like, oh, that's me. You know what I mean? And it's not me. Right. But it's weird because you, you start connecting yourself to it, even though... Absolutely. I, when I teach my lessons, I, the very first step I teach is the I am. And um, simply put, I am the woodland creature. I am the alien. I am. It's happening to me right now. But a lot of actors will say, well, he, or when he is, when he is, or when he is. But unless you say it's happening to me right now, it's, you're never going to connect to it. So, so yeah, we do say, oh, that's me. Oh, there I am. I'm Zim. You know? <laughs> that's that's I am Zim. I'm like, okay. I, I am. <laughs> Are you also Billy? Yes. Nope. Oh. Mostly Zim. What? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> you. Um, what would you say gets more frustrating, on stage or voice acting? <laughs> Well, it's hard to blow a take when it's, uh, you know, I mean, we blow takes all the time recording, but it's not the end of the play, yeah. you know what I mean? There's not a live audience and like, oh crap, he forgot his lines or anything. We can just start over. Yeah. But you know, too, rehearsing for a play is really grueling because, I mean, you're doing, what, usually five or six days sometimes. Sometimes eight. Yeah, sometimes eight. eight. But, you know, even just the beginning of rehearsal, when you're starting from nothing, and you're, like, with these new actors, and you don't even know what your character's going to be wearing or feel like or how they're relating to this character, and, it, you know, you're slowly building it little by little by little. You know, it, it never fails for me, like, the last performance of a play. You finally nail it. Yeah. You yeah, finally got like, it. Oh, that's what it means. <laughs> yeah, you're right over right? Or you think yeah. of something new, like the le closing night. That drives me crazy. Frustrations uh, abound in both, but there's, it, you know, to get a regular voiceover gig is sometimes harder than getting a theater job, especially in LA. There's tons of theaters that have plays that they would kill to have you in it because they don't pay you and, you know, they want you to work till midnight or yeah. one in the morning. And so, frustrations career wise, you know, voiceover can be frustrating. Every, every day we have more and more people coming into voiceover because they discover it. When I started in voiceover, um, like in domestic animation, I know they always say this, there were only like 10 or 12 people doing all the voices, and it was true. Yeah. But we also came in at a time when cable exploded. So they couldn't do all the jobs, and that's how we all got in the door. So um, so that can be frustrating. You know, she's had her hand up for a while. But, yeah. It's, it's more of a dare than a question. <laughs> We imitate each other. No. Like, I, I will imitate. I will imitate uh, Kyle. Hi. <laughs> so she means I will imitate each other, Richard. Like each other's actual voices. Sort of like that. But I think of Elaine Stritch. <laughs> oh, well, it just sounds like an act. My voice or is Carol Channing. Yeah. Carol Channing. Carol Channing. Uh, he's a male Carol Channing. <laughs> Hello, Doc. <laughs> Hello, Doc. Well, hello, Dolly. No, 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 that's Louis Armstrong. <laughs> hello, no, Dolly. Okay, Cher. Does anyone know who Cher is out there? <laughs> Gypsies, tramps, and thieves. Oh, 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 I did a show. I did a show with. You guys know this comedian named um, J. 
Judy Tenuta. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I was on this thing called Rick D's yeah. Into the Night. Oh, had, oh. Yeah, a long time ago. Yes. I, just, I was on a skit on, on that show. But she was the guest, and she went out, and she wears this big silver thing, and she goes, If I could turn back time, I would date a fetus. <laughs> Oh my gosh, she was crazy. Yeah, she was crazy. I just have Judy to do that. If you don't know who she is, look her up on YouTube. You know, she might be a little. She used to date Emo Phillips. No way. Oh, wow. I can see that. Yeah. Crazy lady. Fun. I love Emo Phillips. Yeah. I love Emo yeah. What are some of the, um, the characters you guys have played? Oh, the stuff we've played uh, Ryu in Street Fighter, the narrator, Gohan, Dragon Ball Z, Aizen, and Bleach. Mm -hmm. Um, currently, Mikado Ryu uh, Ryugamine in Durabara, um, Beautiful Joe in Marvel vs. Capcom 3, um, Lael in Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Crystal Bearers, um, 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 Amaimon in Blue Exorcist, Riko Inura in, in uh, Nura, Rise of the Yokai Clan recently. Other things, When They Cry, you know, Hiragashi, Samurai Shampoo, things like that. Zim and Invader Zim! Billy in the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, Daggett in the uh, Angry Beavers, Alpha 5 in the Power Rangers, um, Jake Matowski, I uh, Mouth, uh, Kick Ass is uh, LT Graham, Dr. Chipotle, Rasputin, Rasputin in uh, Psychonauts, Orthopox in Destroy All Humans, and the Zoni in Ratchet and Clank, and the Fell Fire Imp in World of Warcraft, the new one. You're also, you're, also, you're also Ziggs in League of Legends. I'm not. I'm <laughs> not. Everyone thinks I am. I'm not. It sounds like me, but it's not. I promise you. You're also I would own it. It's like if someone farted. Would you accept the fart? Who's <laughs> <laughs> with uh, um, I was a uh, Gur on Invader Zim and uh, Bloody the Pig on Invader Zim. Bloody! <laughs> um, before I did uh, Zim, I was a uh, background painter in animation and also a background actor in movies. So I went back to, and, do, and wrote comics and books, and I actually went back to doing that afterwards, mostly. But I, I, was, I was in the movie Argo, uh, but you can only see the top of my head. <laughs> you were He's great. a hostage. Yeah. He's a hostage. Four days of filming for the top of my head. Though? What? Did your hair look good? It's really good. I had all 70s, my 70s suit. That's cool. Ben Affleck is like nine foot two. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed the panel.